They're officially live, broadcasting only on onedealaway.com slash live. This is Money Matters. My name is Nev. And today we're going to take a little bit of a look into the world of cryptocurrencies and what's going on over there. Uh, so I apologize for everybody that I was gone for the weekend. Hopefully you had a lovely weekend, done something fun, productive, and amazing. But we're going to talk a little bit about the Bitcoin price and sort of the fact that it's connected with the stock market. And, uh, you know, there are some reports coming out saying that it's going to decouple and we're going to be looking at that stuff. And of course, we're going to look at some of the stories that we are finding on the web. A lot of it focused on Bitcoin, but of course, we also have some information when it comes to Uniswap. So I do want to welcome everybody watching this live on OneDealAway.com. And I also want to welcome everybody who is watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or whatever other channel that you have found it on. Do me a huge favor, smash the like button, subscribe, hit the bell button, and that way you get notified every time we go live. Uh, this particular episode, I do want to dedicate to one amazing human being that has just recently passed, um, less than about 24 hours ago or so. So this one is for you, Dad. And yes, good morning and welcome. So um, as I have uh, just momentarily mentioned, um, my my dad passed away uh, yesterday. So it's a bit weird uh, to do the show and it's weird not to. And so this one I am doing in his honor. He was um, an incredible man, beyond charming, uh, really, really funny. And uh, you know, he was a human, and as such, uh, not perfect, but he was pretty dang good. Um, I would say he had a good life, and, uh, you know, we're beyond grateful to have met the man and uh, can call him my dad. Um, my dad was a the markets. He was in the uh, working uh, within the money markets with the central bank of Serbia at the time years and years and years and years ago and so thus I am dedicating the brand new asset class um, conversation that we have today to the man. So let's take a look at what's been going on in the markets and as you will see that when we go into the top 100 overall in the past uh, 24 hours so that's the middle line you want to be looking at it's overall green we're doing pretty dang good with Bitcoin now basically uh you know approaching the eleven thousand yet one more time so uh trading at ten thousand nine hundred six dollars and eighty five cents thank you very much it is up 2.3 percent over the last 24 hour period it is slightly down over the course of the seven days ethereum has been right around that 350 360 mark and that's where it is today as well at 359 22 cents up 2.1 percent over the 24 hours and down 3.2 percent over the course of seven days if we look at the biggest gainers in the top 100 you will see that ar um, is definitely winning by 48.4 percent sxp at 29.1 percent omg 24.7 nest 16 percent ada um adam not adam adam 11.7 rune 11.3 zrx nano xtz ada luna algo and so on and so on and so on when we look at the biggest reds there's nothing that is hugely negative uh, we do have uniswap as the biggest uh, loser of the day at negative 4.7 percent and negative 13.2 over the course of seven days so it's definitely dumped quite a bit over the last week but slightly down in 24 hour period still holding at 456 neo is the second biggest loser at 2.9 and negative 13.9 for the week uh, but overall i mean it, even these are not necessarily too <coughs> excuse me too terrible of the numbers um, if you really consider that this is crypto and so a 5% dump is uh, more or less basically not much. 
But I do want to take a look since we are on the Uniswap. There is a piece of information, a piece of news that has been released uh, over by Cointelegraph that talks a little bit about how Uniswap release of coins and governance uh, might have been slightly misled to the community. So let's take a look into that particular stuff. A recent post from Glassnode has recently has called Uniswap decentralization into question. Uniswap's team, investors, and advisors have been allocated 40% of all Uni tokens, with 21.51 of that figure going to the latter two, meaning investors and advisors. Distribution of these tokens, which was meant to take place over the four years, uh, but there's no public schedule that has been released. Uh, one of the other pieces that Glassnode has been taking, uh, talking about is that the token allocation to the Uniswap team and investors are currently held in regular Ethereum accounts with no transfer restrictions, meaning they can go in and transfer and, and dump whenever they want to. In contrast, the governance treasury token are locked up in a smart contract and will be released programmatically over time. So that's one thing that Glassnode has said they don't really like. They also criticized the project governance, uh, basically saying that, hey, you need to possess at least 1% of the entire unit supply. However, because the supply is not necessarily quite released, the glass note indicates that the threshold is actually 8% of the current, uh, currently cur circulating supply. And basically said that the only one entity that currently has enough unis to submit a governance proposals appears to be Binance, which is a centralized exchange and in direct uh, competition with Uniswap. And that is putting a lot of questions for a lot of investors about what's happening with Uniswap tokens and why it's not necessarily uh, you know, as as good as it could be, I guess. You know, maybe that's maybe that's what the question is. Is it as good as it potentially could be? Because now you have one competitor basically that owns most of it. So in the traditional world of finance, we would never necessarily see that. Uh, typically, you would see that the competitor would not necessarily own the competitor. But now we're saying, well, this one actually has more voting rights, and that could potentially open some trouble for Uniswap and Uniswap users, but it could also benefit Binance. So we will see how the whole thing is going to turn out, but it is something that is very interesting we should be paying attention to. Now, there's a new study that has that the number of unique crypto users has increased 189% in the past year. A new report published by University of Cambridge says that the number of crypto assets accounts held by the service providers has increased fourfold over the last four years with 101 million across 109 one million accounts this is actually really really good and lets us know that hey you know this is continuing to grow it will continue to grow now we're not seeing necessarily price moves as much as we would and a lot of folks are sort of wondering you know like if uh the micro strategy has sort of purchased all of those bitcoins and stuff you know how did they not move the price well they've been moving it buying it very very slowly so they don't move the price i mean why would you pay extra if you don't have to and i think more of the uh, larger institutional investors are potentially going to do that and we have news about additional large scale investor that has just done that and we're going to take a look in just a moment the number of users has increased by 189% since that last year, and that is incredibly good and incredibly bullish in my personal and humble opinion. The study also estimates that on average, renewable energy powers 39% of all proof of work mining, with hydroelectric energy being the main source. Now, this potentially could be nothing, but it also could be very, very important if you think about it on the large scale of how are we going to pay for these projects. So I could see some crypto um, entering the hydroelectric and energy space above and beyond of what just energy web does although energy web could be a very clear leader in this whole uh, sort of a race to win in this particular arena finally the study says that the number of stable coins continue to increase with the share of service providers supporting tether growing from 
4 to 32 percent between 2018 and 2020. Now, stable coins, of course, as you know, are basically pegged to a particular currency or basket of currencies, as some of them are going to do um, or are doing or are in process of creating, uh, which basically limits some of the ups and downs that we experience when we are dealing with cryptocurrencies and using them for payment methods. Speaking of payment methods, you might be thinking about, you know, how can accepting cryptocurrency, you know, play inside the business. And for that, of course, we do have a particular article over here. Now, of course, it talks about what cryptocurrency is. We already know that, so we're not going to dive into it. A business will see many benefits when accepting cryptocurrency. Banks institutions can often be difficult and controlling where you do or don't invest your money and what you do in it. With crypto funds, you control everything and Dynamic gives you more agency to invest and sell the assets in the way that you want to. So you can leverage your assets in a way that makes more sense for you. It makes it easier for groups and people to pay together in one payment. And I think that this is one of the key benefits, especially if we are talking about relatively expensive uh, particular you know investments that maybe a few of us want to sort of pitch in so instead of us all of us you know doing the wire transfer paying you know 25 to 50 bucks to transfer into one account and then going for a large purchase now we can actually fractionalize it amongst us and save a lot of time and money now it can save money because transferring money with cryptocurrency is cheaper, as we've discussed previously on the channel, and cryptocurrency doesn't have a chargeback. All transactions are final. So this could be the good and the bad. The good news is that you as a business owner don't have to deal with those things. The bad part kind of comes in when it comes to the customers, and I think that's where we're getting some sort of pushback from the customers saying, well, wait a minute, you know, if the product doesn't work as well as I thought or I'm not happy or whatever. So I still do suggest that businesses who want to go into the crypto and want to provide crypto payments for their businesses still create some sort of contractual piece. Um, you know, of course, keep up with whatever you promised, but, you know, paying the customers back. So it might not be necessarily the chargeback, but it could be one of those pieces that, you know, you're not happy with the product will just pay you back. So transfer the money over to them. Um, you know, so that could be a solution, an easy solution to work around with. And of course, if you're a bit of a programmer, you can probably put it in the smart contract and kind of lock up the funds that way. So kind of the way I'm thinking about, say that I am doing a course, which I am, uh, that you can go in and you have 30 day guarantee, money back guarantee, right? So you get into the course and over the course of 30 days, the money when you uh, pay for the course sits in the smart contract for 30 days, meaning I don't really have it. Smart contract has it. As long as you are satisfied over the course of 30 days and basically don't request a refund because you're saying, well, the product works, I'm learning a lot, this is beneficial to me, it's meeting my expectations, hopefully even exceeding them as many people have said that they are, um, you know, uh, as long as you don't hit anything 30 days later on 31st day, I get the funds and that's that it's finalized for all. But say that, you know, you went in thinking, hey, this is a get rich quick scheme and I'm going to learn really quickly. And then you get into the course and you're like, oh, man, I actually have to work for something. I have to do stuff. And you decide this is not for me. You click a button for a refund and you get your money back automatically from the smart contract. Pretty dang cool, huh? So it makes the international, um, of course, working with cryptocurrency, um, you can expand the customer base. Of course you can, because there are many, many people that are very familiar and very comfortable with the new form of payment. So you could get into the new demographics. It makes the international sale way easier because they don't have to deal with the dollars and conversion and all of those different things, credit cards. So it's much easier for them to potentially uh, transfer, um, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, ERC, uh, stablecoin, whatever, right? And of course, you can gain most of the uh, form integrating. Uh, the, they're saying that you can gain a lot from it. And they're arguing here that the large businesses gain the most. But I would argue that the smaller businesses can as well. Now, there are some cons to accepting uh, the cryptocurrency. One drawback is that it's very volatile with Bitcoin. You know, it could have gone up and then down. So one of the ways to do that is you could utilize a stable coin for your transactions, which basically takes out this drawback of the utilization of the cryptocurrency in your business. 
It doesn't have the range that a regular money does. It can collect interest and only select location would accept it, which is potentially true. But now with the DeFi and staking and all of the, the, the other stuff, you actually can collect interest by swapping into different things and staking the money. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, you know, there are places like BlockFi, for example, where you can take, uh, you know, certain cryptos, for example, USDC, and uh, you deposit into their quote unquote, as I like to call them, savings account, and you get 8.6% annual return on investment yield. Um, that's that's a really good thing, especially for a business that is just looking for a stable thing to kind of stay flat. So you're not necessarily losing on the uh, volatility component um, and you're still earning interest. So that too is dispelled from this particular article. Now, the other part is they're talking about security being a touchy subject, which potentially could be, you just have to make sure that if you're using smart contracts, that those are vetted, that they're correct, that they are tested. And uh, the lack of centralization can be a plus us, but there's a drawback if you choose to if you lose your funds or cyber criminal steals them you likely won't get that money back so that is absolutely true so you, one of the pieces that you want to do is make sure you protect your money you educate about it about the cryptocurrencies and uh, you know diversify 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 get some stuff off of the hot wallets into the cold storage and uh, you should be doing just okay um, and of course never issue your private keys whatsoever and uh, you know Remember your password, I guess. That's as simple as that. So businesses that should not accept cryptocurrencies are newer, smaller enterprises. And I, again, I disagree with that piece. I think you can uh, just be smart about it. So I wouldn't necessarily do all of that stuff. But you can uh, you can definitely, you know, diversify in what cryptos and what currency payments you receive. So you could do credit card uh, through Stripe or PayPal or any of those things, traditional methods. And then you can also do a portion in the crypto. That diversification gives you access into many different things without necessarily betting on just one component. And you could do that as a small or large business and it doesn't necessarily matter as much. Now, one of the pieces that I've mentioned earlier in the episode is that uh, there is a large company that has purchased even more Bitcoin. And that is Grayscale, of course. They announced uh, yet another purchase of $186 million. They uh, purchased 17,100 BTC to their funds. And the total assets under management for Grayscale Investment Crypto Fund total $5.8 billion. Out of that, the largest fund is in the Bitcoin Trust uh, with $4.8 billion, followed by Ethereum Trust at uh, $784 million. And then the rest is uh, divided into smaller funds of Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, XRP, Zcash, and a couple of more and this is very very cool and very important because we're seeing more and more people get into the bitcoin more and more people starting to expand beyond just bitcoin into some of the other assets uh, we saw that microstrategy definitely has put in a substantial amount of cash into bitcoin uh, which definitely makes it a bitcoin whale right now it's a very risky proposition for all of us because if uh, they decide to dump, which they can very easily, it could definitely take us from the 10.9 or whatever that we were in, uh, you know, down to like three, four, five thousand. But uh, that's not necessarily the worst idea on the planet. And I don't know that they would necessarily do it. Potentially they could, but I don't know that they would necessarily do it because they would also end up losing on it. So they wouldn't, uh, if they're smart, like they were smart about buying it without increasing the price, um, they would potentially be smart about dumping it over the short period over, over the longer period of time uh, so that it does not necessarily affect the price of Bitcoin but then again everything and anything is possible and the way that I think about it is that more and more large investors get in and they are and uh, uh, they're just not quite announcing it yet because they don't want the price to pump you want to buy it at the lowest possible uh, price that you can and then have it pump after that so as that happens and will continue to happen, um, you know, it takes them, 
uh, you know, an average four to six to 18 months to get into their positions. That basically gives us at the earliest into the late winter, early spring of 2021 before we see some major moves in Bitcoin. Uh, are they going to be? Are they not? I honestly don't know. My crystal ball, ball broke years ago, uh, but I believe that there is a good potential as more and more companies start announcing that they are having exposure to Bitcoin, that more and more retail investors are going to start coming in and are not going to pay attention to buy sort of slowly like the large companies have, which is what's going to rise the prices. And that's what I don't expect to happen until about February, March, maybe April, and then we're going to start getting higher and higher. Again, not a financial advice. I have no clue if this is how it's going to play out, but it does have a very, very strong potential. Speaking of Bitcoin and the holdings, there's one article that is basically saying that, you know, holding as much or as little as 0 0.28 BTC. And, uh, you know, if, if you huddle that much um, and we see the larger adoption, which I think is going to come over the upcoming years, it's not going to come in 2021, but I would think by 2030, it definitely has a strong potential to do that. And if you huddle only 0.28 BTC, uh, you could be in the top 1% of individuals when it comes to money because there's only 0.027 BTC for the current 7 billion people plus minus that we have on the planet and uh, you know it makes sense if you really think about it not not everybody's going to get into it is it going to become a world reserve currency probably not although anything is possible um, but I do think that it's going to gain much larger adoption and so even a small portion of your holding into this particular brand new asset class does have an incredible, incredible potential to really boost your wealth and your nest egg and your, uh, you know, long term investment and strategies. Uh, but, you know, they're saying that, you know, the, the there's an argument here coming from this particular author that is saying that like idea is logically sound, but the, you know, the Bitcoin's global adoption uh, is market cap is approximately 194 billion gold on contracts is 9 trillion market cap and Bitcoin requires significant growth to reach the status of gold. Now it has surpassed the prices of it way, way, way back when, um, but you know, even if it doesn't, uh, necessarily, you know, can it do the nine trillion? I think it's absolutely possible, um, but I don't think it's going to. Again, I don't think it's going to happen in 21. Um, I think it's going to start moving slowly but surely into that particular area. And uh, like I said, with many more large investors getting into this whole thing, uh, we're going to see these prices start moving. The market cap is going to start rising. And like I said. Once more companies start announcing it, and then we're going to start seeing countries that are going to get into it. We haven't seen it quite yet, but we will see it eventually where they're going to start putting portion of their reserves like they do in gold from central banks. They're going to start doing Bitcoin. Once we start seeing some of those components, this puppy is going to take on. And uh, so for me, when I look at the upside versus downside, where even the small portion of it has such a huge upside, it's sort of silly not to at least give it a shot. I'm not saying bet the farm on it, right? But do put a little bit of it. And again, not a financial advice. That's just a, you know what I say to myself. Put a little bit of it and you never know what will happen. Um, you know, if you if, if you put a small portion and you can live with losing it all, uh, no big deal if it all goes away. But if it goes up 10x, 100x, 1000x, um, you know, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Not saying it's going to do it, but it does have a potential, in my humble opinion. And final bit of news has to do with the Bitcoin price and the stock market to decouple soon. And that's coming from... Wollywood, the on-chain analyst. So this is an interesting piece as well because we've noticed that the Bitcoin has been very closely following the uh, stock market. And when the stock market goes up, Bitcoin goes up. When it goes down, Bitcoin goes down. And the price action with the stock market, including the S&P 500, has been highly correlated. However, an on-chain analyst believes that this correlation would soon come to an end. 
uh, Willie Wu predicted that Bitcoin will soon decouple from the stock market, saying, quote, SPX looks very weak. If that plummets, I'll go out on a limb to say BTC will decouple in coming months. Post halvening and reduced derivative trading volumes fundamentally reduce BTC sell pressure against bullish fundamentals of an anti-inflationary hedge. Who explains that if a massive stock market crash were to occur, Bitcoin and the stock market would eventually break its correlation like it did in March. Uh, Bitcoin's internal adoption curve would allow it to outpace the traditional markets. And we do have CEO of Real Vision, Raul Paul, who has been very, very bullish on this whole thing, also believes that Bitcoin has more upside potential than the traditional markets. The Wall Street veteran believes that Bitcoin will be the best performing asset in the next two years. And I absolutely agree with the entire point quote that uh, Raul Paul has said, I'm going to share that with you, is that almost no trade matters except Bitcoin at this point. So here we go. This is where we are. This is where I think, as you may or may not know, and in full transparency, I don't really have anything left in the stock market. I do have some in the, um, in the treasuries and in the bonds. I know you think I'm crazy, but that's okay. Um, and of course, the rest is predominantly real estate, uh, Bitcoin. Um, there's some, uh, you know, Ethereum altcoins and that kind of stuff. Um, investing heavily in businesses, in developing stuff, and of course, having some in precious metals as well. Um, out of all of these, I do believe that Bitcoin has the largest long-term potential of success. And so I am putting my money where my mouth is and betting on crypto thank you for watching do subscribe do hit the bell button do uh <laughs> do hit the like button as well and i will see you tomorrow until then stay forever money blessed and do remember you are only one deal away